Hey everybody, welcome back to Sarge Talk TV. Big Mike here. Little Jason. Little Jason's here. He's over in East Tennessee. I am I am coming from you on a remote location, y'all, right in the nugget. Yeah, he's out in the, he's in the Smoky Mountains in a trailer. So uh, how, how long of a drive was that? Well, it's 10 hour drive time, but I think it actually took us Close to 13. Did it? Yeah, we had a little blowout of a tire on the Nugget. And then uh, coming through Nashville, um, I've already looked for the route home. I'm driving around Nashville and avoiding it because, yeah, that was a killer. Yeah, it's a kind of a zoo there, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. But I'll but, tell you something. I've been over in East Tennessee and it's it's some pretty country out there oh it's it's beautiful here i mean this i wish i like tara and i would have been together back when her dad and and stepmom and first started really living and working this property because he has 10 acres yeah and originally out his back door all you seen was the mountain and it was yeah. just pasture and woods all the way up like there was now there's a huge subdivision yeah and they're the subdivision, I guess, has even been looking and trying to send him offers to buy part of his acreage. On and he's like, "No, I'm good. There's enough of your houses back there. I don't want any more." Yeah. All right. Hey. Uh, so, guys, tonight tonight is an open mic night. If you didn't see the thumbnail, hopefully you did. Uh, we do have the link up there at the top, and you can click on that. Come in the green room. But when you go in the green room, make sure we can see you and not your little cover logo or whatever that's on there we want to make sure you're a real person and you're not some crazy person that's coming up on the broadcast yeah, we're enough crazy for this channel we don't need <laughs> for everybody crazy. yeah so uh um let's see who's in the chat well i see right off the bat glenda grace and fire is already bragging she's got her pink sergeant stock shirt so look at her i i would have had mine Mike, Mike did what he said, guys. He shipped it, and then I left out, and my mail lady doesn't come to the afternoon. So Yeah, but it made it there on Friday. They said two days shipping, and it got there. And you yeah. know how much shipping is now? I'm you live in the state right next to me. It cost me, it cost nine twenty to ship it to the next state over now. They jacked their prices up big time. Seven. Yeah, that's. Hmm? Wasn't it like seven something? Who? Like yeah, it was like seven dollars and something before. So it was like a two dollar jump just to go one state. And then Glenda got hers, but I don't care what it costs for Glenda. She deserves a pink shirt. Yeah. Hey, there's Joe Fix It for you. We've got Piggy's Piddles, Semper Five Piggy. And for. Uh, Mama Carolyn, the we did upload the Sergeant Talk TV uh, T-shirts and coffee mugs on the MT Homestead merch store. I'm not going to pay money for another merch store when we already have a merch store. Uh, so it's all over there, and you can get it in black, navy blue, um, OD green, um, and what else? Red. Red. We didn't put pink on there, did we? So Glenda's going to be the only one with the pink one. There you go. We got to keep keep her in in style, if you will. Right, so that's, right. It's all over there. To go to our about page at Empty Homestead, and if you go down below, you'll see merch store. Just go in there, and if you want one, you can get one out of there. All right. You got to say hi to Charles at Fallen Arkansas Veterans. He yes. is in. So glad yes. to see you in here, brother. Yes, I am. Uh, yeah, Christine, Miss Gillum Farms in here. Yeah. I bet you, you know what? I don't know if she's ever drank in her life, you know, like liquor or something like that. But I, I bet you, if she would be a, she would be a party. <laughs> she, she would probably be out of control. Yeah. Cause she's, she's, she's got the gumption without drinking. So she's fun to be around. Can't wait to see her again. In fact, I just seen her at the Ogie Home Setting Expo. 
Yeah. Hey, there's You're, Reverend uh, James in here. Another jarhead at dawn there at Hat Creek Homestead. My favorite female Marine. Dana Mason. Yes. Let me let me get that one up there. Hey, Mike and Tim and Tim and I are here. We are having a bad week so far. We know tomorrow we'll go back for his treatments next week. Well, you have our prayers every single night from Terry and I. So I we pray for Tim every day. Um, there was someone. Oh, I did see. So David Moffat had popped in. Um, and then I don't know where he. Oh, there's a Randall Gypsy Trails made it. I knew there was a couple in my brain. I'm like, I need to say hi okay. for a minute. Yeah, we'll we'll send you the. Uh, well, the the link is just in our in our about page on Empty Homestead. You can just click on it. Takes you right to the merch store, but we'll send it to you. There's Rainy Ridge. And who is who's who's this character? No idea. What? I I, I see him down in the green room. Must, must be old. They're salty. Yeah. Old salty dog there, huh? <laughs> hey, uh, there's okay, you already said piggy. Um Say hi to, uh, I don't know, did we say hi to Lynn and the Oki? Uh, no, we didn't. We are now. There's three little goats homestead. There. Well. Oh, listening while Jesse AI is a cow. I had to read that a minute. I was like, I'm only, I, I'm only on the laptop tonight, guys. I don't have my big, I can't see nothing screen to go off from, but. There's Web Web. Webs web. There's Judy Herman. There's Kevin and Mr. Jackie over hiking with Jackie boy. All right. Hey, Kevin. There's Debbie Droth. Hey, Debbie. Hey, we did get a message uh, from Susie uh, Jacobson's. Uh, is it her daughter? I think her daughter's been posting uh, yeah. everything on the Facebook. Yes, she's doing stuff. doing better. Yes. Good. That's good. There's Randall saying howdy to everybody. Okay, there she is. I'm rocking my pink yeah. Start to Talk TV. There you go. You'll have to come up and model that thing for us. <laughs> so there's see, ace there's ace yep see karen breast has made it in all right rebecca touched by yarn here to support the veterans that's right her dad and uncles um her veterans yeah, and I think she's got she's got a pretty long line of veteran connection in her family. It's pretty awesome. Yep. There's Liam. He's in here. Um, yep, there is there's Charles. Prayers for Charles. Look at her down there. <laughs> Let's see. We're, we'll get through this, and we'll be right there. Hey, there's David Moffat. David Moffat's in the house. I'm, I'm just stoked. Mike is really starting to get in on this technology stuff, guys. He's running these comments up for you, doing like. I learned from the best over here. Yeah. There's Karen Brass. I can with Jackie boy. Let's see. Angie. I'm just glad everybody's in here. Absolutely, guys. We really appreciate it. I mean, it's a little always weird when you're trying to do a live from like remote location and yeah. not all your usual setup. And it's not in your comfortable chair or your 
Although I will say this bench is more comfortable than the chair I typically sit in to do the live. Oh, so. Really? Yeah. Well, we don't have so with a tiny house, like we do everything from in the kitchen area because my kitchen table I can't even really like kitchen table at because it's my office of holding the computer and everything. Right. And we just bought this like little card table to put in there, and then those chairs that come with it, and they're they're good if you're five, but. So I end up like grabbing a pillow or something to be able to sit through a live. So it's all right. Here we go. Angie. Angie. She's our favorite VA nurse right there, guys. All day, every day. Yep. I just can't sing, so I can't call her out. Well, I can't I can't carry a tune in a bucket. I just I just lose my mind when I see Angie. <laughs> Beautiful. Hey, there they are. There's Tiffany over at Canadian Family Life. All right. I am at the bottom. All right. Let's bring our first uh, our first guest up. There he is. This here is Glenn from Glenn and Shannon's uh, Salty Life. How you doing, brother? Hello? Do you have your sound on? He's muted on his end. Hey, okay. Hey, Can you hear me now? now? And welcome to the channel. And there we go. And the password was... Uh, <laughs> was What's going on, guys? Toothbrush. <laughs> <laughs> Remember that from password? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hey, so what's going on with you down there? Man, good weather. Can't complain a bit. A little spooky last Wednesday, but this week and next week, all, everything's looking good. Well, everything's good. looking good. Enjoying everything. Things but turning pollen. green. Pollen's yeah. still a bitch, but other than that, you know, it's springtime in South Mississippi. There you go. Hey, so tell us about your military service. Uh, what branch were you in? I was in the United States Army. All right. And what did you do for a living? Uh, well... I was a Ford observer. Fisters, they call them 13 Fox. 13 Fox, yeah. yeah. Fun so time. You guys out there on Colt teams, is that what you guys did? They didn't have Colt teams when I was in. I mean, this is back in the 80s. They they started that up, I want to say, sometime during during the GWAT, and they yeah. kind of did away with that after that, if I remember well. Uh, yeah. Kind of a lazy team, those guys. That was a pretty cool job if you, if, if you were – young enough to have had one, at least from my standpoint. But uh, uh, no, I was just a straight up Ford observer. Yeah, because I've worked with uh, um, 369 field artillery. And uh, I, every, I mean, man, I about lost my hearing with those guys. <coughs> yeah. <laughs> it, <Fort> Carson. <coughs> Jeez. Now, if you're on a gun line, maybe even FTC, and I did just spend a couple of years in FTC to get promoted after I got off active duty and got in the reserve, uh, your hearing can be challenged. Out on the hill, it's not so bad. I mean, you're, the explosions are going off, but they're, you know, they're not blowing yours up unless something gets, gets shot out of a, shot out of the safe zone. Then, it, then things get interesting, but uh, yeah. other than that, it's, it's, it's not too bad. Wow. Um, so where were you stationed at? Fort Seal, Oklahoma. Fort Seal, right down the road from us. Yeah. Yeah. yeah if the world ever needs an animal, that's where they can stick it. Lawton, Oklahoma. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Was that your only duty station ever? Or uh well for the most yeah, I, I, I got I I you know kind of sucked to be me, man. Uh I thought I was going to Hawaii and my orders got changed last minute when I was in the tail end of OSIT, first 17th field artillery, Fort Sill, Oklahoma. So I'm like, dead gum. So you uh, went to school there and you stayed. And got stationed there. Yes. Oh, there you go. It was, it was um, I was not a happy guy that day, but it all worked out. That damn king of battle. <laughs> yeah, 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 king of battle. Yeah. Uh, exactly. it's, it's, always, it's always a challenge and, and like, obviously, like, emotionally, right? 
when you go in and, and part of most people's journey when they join is like, I want to travel the world. I want to go to other places. I want to. And then you find out that, uh, yeah, that's not really the option. <laughs> You know, yeah. or you're, and then you don't leave. Um, and that that's was one true thing for that, a lot of Marines. Yeah. Yeah. No, on the bright side, I did get to go for, you know, two weeks at a time to a couple of different places, but I wasn't stationed there, you know, just, yeah, uh, yeah. just, uh, you, you've been out to NTC. Uh, yeah, they didn't call it that then, but it was Fort Irwin, California, and it was nasty. Yeah. Uh, I got to see, um, uh, Last day we were there, I got to see a guy, uh, let's just call it utilized latrine that didn't exist about, I don't know, 100 meters away from where we were standing. And we're all looking at this little dust cloud. Yeah. From way away. Everybody's like, what in the world is that? Folks are getting binoculars out looking. What is that? A freaking iguana came up and dug up this dude's uh, excrement. And yeah. That's the way he went with it. It was awesome. But, uh, <laughs> It was awesome. Uh, <laughs> fun things, fun times. That was. Yeah, I was. Thing. I went to Fort Irwin um, when I was with the Fourth Infantry, with the Fifth Infantry down at Fort Polk. They don't exist no more. Um, before it became the uh, Combined Arms Training Center down there at Fort yeah. Polk. So I was with Fifth Infantry Division. I went there several times. Um, and then I jumped in there with uh, 82nd when I was with them, and I broke uh, 17 bones in my feet. Lovely. And, well, we had we we were flying over. We're we're doing a jump. We flew over, and we had a red light, and we had to pass again. All of a sudden, we had uh, uh, a green light. And I was number three in the stick and out the window we went and I started rocking. I went back, back and I look up, you know, and I'm looking up and all I see is a red light in the door. <laughs> so as fast as it went green, it went red. And when I hit the ground, when I hit the ground, it was like, I could see myself because it was, it was, it was dark and the, uh, um, uh, trash finders, we call them their pathfinders. We call them trash finders. Uh, they had already marked the the LZ, and when I hit that ground, that surface wind just took it and just dragged me, and I fell in some kind of crevasse, and I dislocated a knee and broke seventeen bones in my feet. Mm. Pretty bad. So, yeah, that's yeah. That was my yeah. last trip to the National Training Center. Gory, gory, what a hell of a way to die. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually good friends with the guy. If you can remember, I want to say it was the uh, 60th anniversary of the D-Day invasion of West Pointer that I'm friends with on Facebook. He's, I think, was Lieutenant Colonel at the time that made a jump, and he crashed and burned in on the D-Day reenactment jump. <clears throat> oh really? Yeah, a guy named Jim Rice. He is um uh, he's had multiple surgeries since then. It's like, oh man, that's a that's a bad time to not have a parachute open for you when you're yeah. doing a reenactment jump. But uh anyway. Man. Anyway. So my I, I you were you were an airborne MP or you got an MP that was when you were yeah, I, was with the, I was with the 101st MP company. I got you. Back. Back back when they were still everybody was still airborne for the most part, huh? Yeah. I got you. I got you. Yeah, I got you. Yeah, you were talking about Fort Polk. Hell, my dad was in the fifth infantry in World War Two. Yeah. yeah, he was an old man when I was born. Uh, yeah. When I was but, here, uh, I was in red I was in uh, Devil Troop Brigade on North Fort in all the old World War Two barracks. Yeah. That's where and, my company was. They didn't really give us a choice, but they kind of did. And that was one of the places I picked of all places was Fort Polk, Louisiana. Number one, it was probably four hours away from where I grew up at. Number two, I had relatives who lived around there. Yeah. One that had a fish camp out on uh, Toledo Bend. I'm like, man, it might be the place to be. Yeah. And it was, of course, it's a nasty place, but I mean, so is Fort Seal. So. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's two different kinds of nasty. You know, um, uh, no trees, 
dead looking trees. <laughs> you ever been to yeah. Poland? I mean, you got you got you, got of Oz? you remember when the monkeys came in on the Wizard of Oz? Yeah. That's what winter is like in Louisiana. Well, okay. yeah. I mean, I, I grew up. I grew up four hours away from Mississippi. I mean, it's just it, it really yeah. wasn't much different from where I grew up at. So I, I've been okay with that. I just, you know, just back in the eighties, and I, I don't know. Uh, maybe it's changed some. It's just the, the folks in Lawton did not like the military. Yeah, it's just it was just a bad deal. Like anywhere else I've ever been, they're like, yeah, they accept you. They'll take your money. Oh, they'll take your money in Lawton, all right. It's like one of the hottest places in Oklahoma. It's like one of the hottest places in Oklahoma. Is that whole Lawton area? It's yeah, hot. it's hot there. Uh, kind of like a hairdryer blowing on you in the summertime. Yeah. Uh, I remember one day where it was, uh, I want to say it was late May, where we were getting sleety on for PT early in the morning. Let's see that Noon shirt. It's scalding hot. You got and it. that afternoon, there's there probably you, water, so you can get froze to death. <laughs> I good. love it. I love it. Burned and blown away in the same day. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. guys, enjoy your, your program, enjoy your channel, I should say. Uh, thanks for having me on. All right, brother. You have a good one. All right, yeah, absolutely. Man. Thanks Take for care. coming up. It's what this no is all about for all of us to uh, hang out and tell our individual stories and yep. Just... Say hello for to Shannon for us. I got Terry over here keyboarding it, answering questions. <laughs> oh, nice. Saying hello. I know a lot of that you're talking about. Like, to... she's my seventy-one Lima. My admin personnel. P Piggy was talking about that earlier was where he kind of had that same issue when he was in the Marine Corps was went to school at 29 Palms and then got stationed in 29 Palms. Yeah. Oh, Lord. And like I spent two years. I went out there for training exercises, but I did spend two years stationed out there. And it was reminding me, like Glenn was saying, that the heat, I mean, the only thing that saved you was there wasn't humidity. Yeah, but that heat was still I mean, it, it was as close to being in Afghanistan as you possibly could or Iraq because that heat right. just it's like having the hairdryer on you. But then all your if you did start to sweat or when you started to sweat, it dried almost as fast as it was created. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he dropped off. He did. He did. So how's how's Glenda doing? Hi. This is Glenda the Good Witch. <laughs> yes. Hey, I'm wearing my pink. I mean, there you go. You know, the, the Glinda the Good Witch of the North, she wore pink. Yeah. So I've got my pink and I love it. Yeah, it's it good. is so comfy and the quality is fabulous. Good. And I love that I can advertise and rock the shirt. So there you go. This is awesome. Awesome, awesome. And Sir Grace right. can't steal it, so because he won't work. That's <laughs> right. You're the only one. I'm not making another pink one. I actually somebody, unless somebody really begs. That's okay. I actually looked because I bought Sir Grace one, so he's gonna rock a blue one. Okay, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Oh. So I oh, love it. Med medical blue, isn't it? Yeah. Well, yeah. he was Air Force, so I got him blue for the Air Force. Yeah, because for us, blue represents the medical part. I mean, yeah, their light he, on is blue is for the medical, isn't it? Or is it red? I don't know. It's one or the other. It's. I don't know. So the yeah, the I it, it made me glad. As confused as I was about how the Marines ran things. Yeah. And then the more like soldiers I met of like being in the army and the, the different patches. And I'm like, guys, I'm lucky to tie my boots. And you want me to know based on this and that guy down. And like, I, I couldn't. Well, you know, up. it's a staff with, with two snakes on it. That's all I'm. It is. Yeah. But yeah. Sir Grace's, I know his, if I saw it. It, yeah. it, he worked in the medical. So yeah. 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 In fact, we were we uh, were pulling out his uniforms over the weekend, and I hadn't seen them in probably about ten years. We were putting them into some nice bags to preserve them, and it was just fun going down memory lane, looking at all the uniforms and 
all of his ribbons and all that good stuff. So yeah, yeah we were enjoying it. My dress uniform in the closet. When mm -hmm. I got out of the service, I was 234 pounds, mm -hmm. 285 now. So I'm pretty sure that that uniform does not fit. Yeah. <laughs> I, I actually was talking to somebody about that not too long ago because they're like, hey, have you put any of your uniforms on since you've gotten out? And I'm like, well, no. Yeah. Because like technically, like I could say if I went to an event or whatever, right? I could put my dress blues on and still go as a retiree. Absolutely. But then this has to go. And I'm like, <laughs> not happening. Not nope. I, I'll wear the lapel yeah. pin. I'll do um but part of that conversation was the fact that I'm like, it will probably be big because I had gained quite a bit of weight and I was probably over 250 pounds touching the 260, 265. And I'd had my uniforms tailored to that. So it didn't look so horrible. Yeah. And then I, when I got out, I had, I started working at a, like a youth camp or whatever, but I became more active. I yeah. moved back to the family farm. I'd done these things. So I wasn't sitting behind a computer all day in a desk, you know, yeah. just shoving fat cakes down my mouth. Right. And I was out. And so I lost probably 25 pounds right away. Yeah. And I remember going back uh, for another buddy's retirement. And they're all like, dude, what the heck? Like, you get out of the Marine Corps, then you find the gym. And I'm like, I didn't find no gym. I can promise you that. I was like, what I found was a hay wagon that needs loaded eight bales high yeah. and all these cattle that need fed. Like, I I don't have time to sit around. And eventually, when we'll dig them out, Tara's never actually seen me wear any of my uniforms in person. Mm. Yeah. So I'll probably do a dress show for her one day. Be like, you're going to see it with a beard. I Because she don't want the beard gone either, so... Oh, I think well, that's nowadays awesome. I would wear a black suit with a uh, um, white shirt, and then you have your uh, mini medals mm -hmm. on the one side. That's that's I'd never put on another uniform, I just wear a black suit and, a, and my ribbons on there. That's it, yeah. But you know, else you know up how, up. how expensive that is, yeah. I was gonna say, they're expensive. To make those for a suit. Mm -hmm. Plus, I, I really don't want to wear them anyway because when you got too many, it's just like, uh, I don't know. Yeah. But it, yeah. it's, just, it's just too much. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Well, and then I think a lot of it is like trying to remember because honestly, by picture, I couldn't tell you what each one of my individual ribbons are. Yeah. No. One, because nope. they just, they really, I got them and I'm proud that I have them, but I would have been fine without them because it's just more crap you got to deal with on your uniform and inspections and stuff. So to know exactly what they were for, and then that's that was always a problem. It's like, oh, what'd you get this one for? I was like, uh, Marine Corps? Uh, I, <laughs> sorry, guys, I'm not the walking encyclopedia you might have expected, but I'm... Just give me my crayons, just, I'll be okay. Well, I know that some some people, some people, they just all they when they do it in their in a, a suit, they just take their highest three or four ribbons and put them on there. They don't put everything on there. Right. Just, that's about it. So that's something I want to do for Sir Grace. We looked at him and and he actually remembers what each of his ribbons are. We were yeah. talking about it. There's a good website. It's called Easy Rack. Mm -hmm. It's Easy Rack, and you can you can actually get a sticker made for your win back window mm -hmm. or whatever you want to do. They make this your ribbons in a sticker, or um, they can make your ribbons in miniature, uh, which is cool. When I met Terry, uh, we were we got married and we were moving. And we were putting stuff in boxes for the movers were coming. And she opened up this old member of the cassette players. Um, mm. They used to come in like a little case with a handle on it. And she opened it up and she's going, what is all this? And I go, oh, those are just medals from when I was in the army. She goes, why are they just stuffed in a box? I said, I know what I did. I don't really, you know. And she goes, oh, my gosh, you should have these on the wall. And I go, ah, 
I couldn't get a dental appointment with Netflix nowadays. <laughs> Sir Grace yeah. tried that one, and I'm like, this is my house to decorate however I want to decorate. Yeah. All that's going up on the wall. We have an I love Sir Grace wall. And and as you walk in and you look to the right, you see everything. So yeah. Yeah, it, I'm like, see, there it is. <laughs> that's yeah. his. And we in the military, we call that our I love me wall. That's what yeah. we I like. I love Sir Grace because <laughs> I did it. <laughs> I mean, she wants to do it. That's up to her. But I just. Uh, I mean, I've been retired how long now? 24 years? Me and 24 married. years. One, one April was my 24th year being retired. Wow. So. Wow. I love me wall. It says, this is what I did. This is where I've been. And this is what I, what I am proud of. And this is how I got all my degrees and stuff. But after that, People just look at it and they say, yeah, that's a loving wall, but that's not you today. That was you yesterday. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You keep coming everybody, in broken up. Every, everybody likes a loving wall as being just, that was you yesterday, but that's not you today. I'm sorry if I'm breaking up. Yeah, very, very, very bad internet yeah, connection here today. Right yeah. Rehab, oh, you got the you got the scanner on. Yeah. I'm trying to turn it all the way down so I don't have to hear it. There we go. It's all the way off now. But yeah, and I love me wall is great, but and I love me wall just says this is what I did then. But that was yesterday, you know? Yeah. You don't have it today. You don't have it today. Today, everybody says, oh, what were you doing when you were in? Well, that's a different story. Yeah. Me, you guys were talking about 71 Limas. I was a 71 Lima time admin specialist. And I wrote paychecks for everybody that was in the military. Yeah. HHC, you know, headquarters, yep. headquarters command. And we wrote paychecks for everybody. And if you were there, you got paid. If you weren't there, you didn't get paid. And then I was reliable for writing out letters to say, why weren't you there when you were supposed to be? Yeah. You know? Mm. Well, I will tell you that the 71 Limas, the company admins, they knew more about what was going on in your company than anybody else. And, and the, they knew everything. And yeah. I, used, I, I used to buddy up and do favors for our company clerk because when you wanted to know some something, that's who you went to. Yeah. Because they knew what was going on. 70, 71 Limas always knew what was going on. We made we we wrote we we were the guys who wrote the paychecks to everybody that was in the army. Yeah. And the seventy one Lima's always knew everything that was gonna be going on or was going on. And it was always based on do you do you see something in the future that's gonna happen where somebody's gonna get shipped out? Yes, we did. Because we were part of the headquarters in command. Where they would come in and say, hey, something over here is going to happen. We need to have you ready, but this is what your pay rate is going to be if it does. We, we were always there for that. Yeah. Always. Well, I'm going to let you guys chat, and thank you for the shirt again. I'm, You're I welcome. appreciate it. You guys have a wonderful night, and I'm going to get into the chat. <laughs> All right. Bye. Bye-bye. Angie, have a good night. Let's good see. Night. If I, anybody I, else I, wants to come up and uh, talk, uh, you can talk about your, your uncles, your dads, your whoever. I don't care yourself, but like Piggy. Piggy, I know Piggy's got some stories. Every time I'm on his channel, he's got a story. So they were doing hard checks back when you were still doing it, David? Yes. Yeah. 
absolutely. We we did all kinds of checks and balances. Actually, it was like okay. When I when I was in there, there we had we actually had to take over New York State um, National Guard to say, hey, there's a problem over here. There's a lot of pe people missing that are in the New York State National Guard that aren't showing up for the meetings. Can you take it over? And we were like, yeah, we'll take it over. We're in New York State. So we took it over. And we said, how many people over here are not going to show up and get, and get paid for not showing up? And we had to go in and do that. It was it was like really outrageous that we had to do it for New York State because my unit was in New York State, but that wasn't my purpose of my unit. My unit was the Army. My purpose wasn't the wasn't the National Guard. Yeah. But they brought my unit. They brought my unit into the National Guard and said, "Straighten out our problem." And I'm like, "How can we do that? Seriously, how can we do that?" The National Guard units had like. Thousands and thousands of members, and they were not showing up for anything and expecting to get a paycheck. And we had to go in and figure it out. And it was like, how do we do that? It took, it took a long time for our unit to be able to go in and say, okay, now we can do this, but you're taking us away from the regular army. Who needs to get regular paychecks too? And you're, you're really disturbing our unit. They actually brought in their own um, 71 lane with 10 to the National Guard and said, "Okay, we'll do this. You do that." Because it was it was too much. It was it was a really really bad transition period. I think I want to say it was 1993. It was a really bad transition period where. There was just so many in National Guard that weren't showing up. Yeah. So we had to go in. We had to go in and say, you don't get paid. You didn't show up. You know? But it was it was it was a terrible situation. It was a terrible situation. And there was a lot of people that didn't get paid that probably should have because we couldn't prove they were there. Yeah. Because we spent too much time doing bull crap. Of trying to follow the National Guard people. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Hey, what's the weather like up there in New York? Uh, right now, it is probably about 54 degrees, but it's going to drop again this weekend. We're going to be raining for the next five. Oh, wow. I don't know. I, I can't and hear you. Put out today and wouldn't care about. Oh, okay. I got I got four I got four big, really big chickens I could put out today in my chicken pen and not care about them because they've got really big feathers on them. And then I've got six more that I got to go out. Actually, seven more because of my little man. So where did where does uh, seventy one Lima's where'd you go to basic at? I'm hoping I for all of so. Oh, maybe not. Where'd you go to base okay. again? What's that? Did you go to base again, Jackson? Yeah, I did my base again, Jackson. I was in what's called New Hollywood. Brand new did, bro. Didn't uh, the admins, the 71 Limas, and all that series go to Fort Ben Harrison, Indiana for school? No. No, oh, we it said wasn't? It for Jackson. We said it for Jackson. Yeah, but Our, not for your AIT, was it? Yeah, my my AIT was also a for Jackson. Oh, okay. We didn't, stay, we didn't stay in the same basic um, barracks or whatever. Yeah, we got moved over to other barracks. Okay. When I, was in, when I was in basic, we were at Fort Jackson, what they called New Hollywood, which is like brand new barracks. It was oh, okay. awesome. It was awesome. Okay. And then when we got into AIT, they put us still in Fort Jackson and they put us over to another place. 
after that, then then they sent us to um, Fort Lambert, Missouri. Oh, okay. Once you once you finished AIT, you went automatically to Missouri. Oh, okay. And that was like okay, we went from really really beautiful barracks. <laughs> they were brand new to being not so beautiful, but still pretty new to going over to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, and they were nasty. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Clean hey, Daniel, Daniel Kearney is sitting on his porch in Tombstone, Arizona. Yep, enjoying the warm weather. We used to live in uh, Sierra Vista, and we lived over at Tombstone. We loved Tombstone. Yeah. I've never been there. I would love to see it. I would love to see it. I yeah. actually was out for land in Arizona for sale today for somebody who moved to Arkansas. And they said, well, we got land for sale in Arizona. And I'm like, yeah, I don't want Arizona. Sorry. <laughs> I'm looking for Arkansas. <laughs> yeah. It was like, wow, why did you offer that? And they're yeah. like, well, you wanted to move. And I was like, yeah, out of New York. By all means, but not Arizona. Yeah, that's not my, that's not my that's not my purpose. You know, my purpose is to go to Arkansas and start a homestead. It's not to go to Arizona. How do you start? Ooh, in, rose trees in bloom. How do you? How yeah, do you we start? Going to that place where the rose tree, that big thing is. Yeah. All right. See. Yeah, I'd seen that, that comment from Glenn about, uh, you know, remembering, and I think this is part of, you know, doing this channel, but then, you know, because obviously it's connecting us with other veterans. Yeah. Um, you know, but then it's so funny that when you get talking with somebody, there's things that you didn't necessarily realize you'd forgot about it because you never had any reason to talk about it. And then it'll come up and it starts just bringing more memories of things that you thought you'd forgotten, but because you get yeah. to talk, you know, with fellow veterans or people that were in, you know, in that same place. And you're like, Oh, there was that, that was there. Like, yeah. Well, they're that, not doing it every day. That's true. Um, we have a, we have a sense of being very comfortable with our uh, brother veterans and stuff like that. And uh, I get I get what he's saying. I get what he's saying. We, yeah. we actually get lost. We actually get lost where we where we can go. Say go to McDonald's. I meet a fellow veteran. We go there and we can talk to that. We may even forget what we ordered for dinner or <laughs> breakfast or whatever because that veteran yeah. is there. We're locked into that veteran. What's he saying? What's he got to say about this stuff? You know, what did he go through? And I do that a lot. I don't know how many times I've gone to McDonald's and said, I'm not even going to go to the counter. I'm going to go over. This guy's got a veteran hat on. I'm going to go over and talk to him. And yeah. I want to know what his story is. And I'll say, but I'm going to order for breakfast later and ask him, what is your story? And yeah. I'll be honest with you guys. I don't know if you've ever done this, but you should. Because the stories they tell you are so outrageous. Yeah. Sometimes they're willing to talk. Sometimes they're not. Nine times out of ten, if they have a Vietnam hat on, they're willing to talk to you. You know? And you listen to what they say, and it's like, wow. I had one. I had one that was a, a Japanese, hat, and he was a veteran. And I went over to talk to him. I said, "Why you got Japanese hat on?" He says, "Because I stand for the Japanese." Oh, can you hear him? It's cutting in and out really, really bad. Okay. Well, hey, uh, there's Piggy. He said, g giving a blessing. I don't know what the heck. There he is. 
I'm going to drop off so you oh, can there you hear go. me. Man. Yeah, you're still getting broken up. Yeah, you are too. So I'm going to drop out. All right, brother. All right. Thanks for coming up, David. We appreciate it. Hey, no problem. Okay. I want to talk to Reverend Dream. That's who I want to talk to. And I want to talk to Daniel Carney. <laughs> I want to talk to Piggy. Oh, he grew yeah, up we... in Tombstone. Oh, wow. Yeah, and it's, you know, and, and kind of like I see Reverend Dreams talking, you know, saying it took me a uh, right here, it took a long time to be around others. And, yeah. um, you know, it did. It, 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 it is a big transition. I mean, I know we talked about it, you know, a couple weeks ago, you yeah. know, that transition over and, and we still have more to like talking about our personal experience. But, you know, when you're in it every day, you almost take advantage of it because yeah. you're like, hey, I've got it. It's here. I can talk Marine stuff every single day. I'm around them, you know, or sure. Army or whatever. And, you know, uh, but we just know that our fellow veterans, like, they get it because they served, they understand, and we can use that terminology. And and it's awesome to see people making those comments because it means that, hey, we're doing what we're supposed to do. Like, get you guys up here and, you know, you don't got to yeah. be shy. No, just get to talking. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, it's uh, – I know uh, next week we're going to be talking about uh, duty stations uh, and the name changes of a lot of military bases and why they did it, okay? Um, I remember when they first announced it, my old brigade commander, who is now a three-star – uh, was on that board when they did the renaming of uh, the bases. Mm. And how they come up with the names, I have no freaking idea, but it it pissed off a lot of people. A lot of people. But they don't care. I mean... Uh, no, they, they... You know, and I think that that's the... the... It, one, it makes me glad that I'm not still in to have to deal with all this PC stuff. Yeah. Right. Because at least in our generation, at the time that we served, we didn't have to worry about that type of thing. But I think that's probably the biggest aggravation is that they change it. And there's not a valid reason other than PC. And well, just, and that, you're absolutely right. The PC part of it, because it happened. It started happening right when we had to tear down all the war uh, memorials and everything right. and and uh, tear down sides of mountains they wanted torn down. And uh, they, I mean, they even vandalized Abraham Lincoln in, in the, in the, on the mall and all this other stuff. And then they went in to say, hey, let's be politically correct. Well, the correct thing is, is there was a South, there was a North, there was a war, there were generals, they all went to West Point they ended up where their families were when the war broke out. So, you know, when you try to erase history, you're doomed to repeat the history. Right. Okay? You should learn from it. Okay. But everybody's feelings are so hurt. Terry's looking at me like, man, you better get off your, your soapbox. But no, it's and I'm with you. And I guarantee but that a vast true. majority of the people that are here are on the same page of, you know, when they started doing it because of feelings like that. Yeah. Man. Your feelings. That's all I'd say. <laughs> What's going on, Reverend Dream? Hey, brother. How you doing? I'm, I'm doing good. I'm, I'm honored to be here with y'all tonight. Hey, we're honored to have you up here. Absolutely. We appreciate you coming up. Yes, sir. I appreciate being, being invited. Uh, I, uh, I might have a little bit to tell, you know, and, and uh, I come from a family who, who served. Uh, I had an uncle that served five tours of Vietnam. Uh, his name was Clifford, Clifford and uh, Clifford Beck. Uh, he did signal. Uh, he run the front lines uh, in Vietnam and seen a lot of hard things. Yeah. 
uh, he was a young man when he went in. He was like maybe 17. He got a waiver to be signed in. Uh, he went in place of my father, who, uh, who who dodged his draft by sending his younger brother. No. Oh, wow. uh, he, uh, my dad wasn't a really nice man, uh, really abusive to the children that he had and uh, really didn't care for us at all. Never loved us or never, never, claimed, you know, he, uh, it, it, it was a pretty hard life growing up as a child. And so I excelled in sports. I put myself into the sports scene, football and weightlifting, uh, wrestling, martial arts, uh, bare knuckle boxing. Yeah. Uh, these are things I love to do. And, uh, and I excelled in it. Um, I was a two time all state center for, uh, Hampton, uh, in Arkansas, uh, playing for the Bulldogs and, uh, was supposed to have went and played for either the Razorbacks. I had a scholarship as a center. I was 168 pounds, uh, moving 400 pounds off, off the, of the uh, field everywhere I wanted to put them. Uh, and I had a, a Washington Redskins contact me and wanted me to be a walk-on draft choice. Uh, but my life was so abusive at home and I was going through so much turmoil that I turned it all away when dad thought that he was going to take a free ride with me and uh, yeah. use my name to get where he needed to be. And with, with his honor and his dignity, I didn't think he deserved it. Yeah. Uh, I'm a man of uh, character. I'm a man of honor. Everything I've done, I've done to the best of my ability, whether it was playing hopscotch or checkers. Uh, so I decided instead of having the sports that I really love, I'd turn it all down and uh, fulfill what my father should have did in the first place and join the military like my uncle did. Yeah. My uncle become one of the 22 that we talk about daily. Yeah. Um, it's really hard because I held him, held him in high regard. When he come back from Nam, uh, he come back with two things, uh, a sack of prescription pills and one sack, one paper sack and uh, a bag of marijuana and the other. Yeah. And he carried them around everywhere he went. Wherever he went, he had them two sacks. So as a young man, I watched and I studied what my uncle had to go through because of what my daddy failed to do. So I always felt that it was my necessity and my responsibility to make up for his shortcomings. As a child, you never know what to do in life, but you know what not to do. And right. mine was not to follow my father's footsteps but to follow somebody that had honor and dignity. And that's what I chose to do. Uh, on my 17th birthday, I signed up for the United States Army. My thing was uh, to go overseas and fight for my country. I didn't care where I went, what I had to do to get where I needed to be because it wasn't me that I was fighting for. It was for others. Yeah. Uh, so when... I went to the military on my 18th birthday. I graduated and uh, dad don't know I was taking the ride with the football game and do the do the pro pro team thing so he could make him a bunch of money at my expense. And I told him, dad, I said, you gotta take me down to the, the station. He said, what for? I said, cause I gotta catch a bus, I'm out of here. He said, what do you mean you're out of here? I said, I've joined the military on my 17th birthday. He said, there's no way. I said, yeah, that's why I'm in delayed entry program. I, uh, I went on in and went to Fort Dead. And I asked him, I said, whatever I could do, ship me overseas because I've got to get away from the country that turned their back on me. And uh, so I went to Germany. It was during the Cold War before the wall was down yeah and uh, i went I, I was in stationed at Wiesbaden. i was a truck driver and my mos was 64 charlie yeah and uh my papers were to drive a general around in a little jeep you know just toot the little horn drive around and be somebody 
Well, my papers got changed when I got there because somebody in the ammo department, the 109-155 Howitzer unit, Charlie Battery 2nd and 20th Field Artillery, didn't have an ammo driver. So I got stationed driving a big old gore. And most of y'all know what a gore is. It yep. I was ammo and amphibious. And yep. So I did a lot with my back. And, and uh, I found out that being having a pen in your hand was a lot easier than using your back. Yeah. But I never got a chance to figure figure that out during that process. And and I broke my leg while I was there. Um, I had a real bad experience with uh, MTS. And I know a lot of men, uh, soldiers themselves, don't talk about uh, MTS. And uh, as a man, it's very hard to talk about. Yeah. I think it's something that the people nowadays need to hear. Uh, as a kid, I was abused by, by a lady for several years. And uh, so I had to get out of the situation I was. So when I went to the military, I thought this was a new beginning, a new chance to become who what God had intended me to be all along. And so while I was serving in Germany, I went to NCO club and uh, I met a sergeant there that was a real nice man. There was a black gentleman that, that took a shine into me. And uh, I just thought he was a likable guy. Uh, I had only been on base for a couple of weeks. And he said, well, come on, recruit. Let me show you how to shine some boots, and give you some shortcuts on polishing brass and things like this. And I said, hey, you know, that's cool, man. You know, if you help me out, I greatly appreciate it because I am a new recruit, you know, and I yeah. didn't nobody. You know what I'm saying? So he takes me to this barracks. We we drank. Back them days, I was a heavy drinker because the abuse that I'd sustained made me a good drunk. Yeah. Uh, so we was polishing off a half a gallon, and he was teaching me the shining of brass and shining of shoes and how to start your uniform real good to be as sharp as only I could look. At least that's what he said. Well, about halfway through the half a gallon, we got pretty hammered and, and it was time to, to crash out and I was gonna walk back across the base. So I told him, I said, well, I guess it's time for me to leave and go on back across. And he said, well, you know, I got, I got bunks. And he did, he had like 12, 15 bunks up there and had his own room to himself. And he said, you can crash here tonight. You walk on across the base tomorrow, go on to your formation, and everything will be copacetic. And I took him as his word, because a man to me is no greater than his word. And so when I go up to him, I said, I'll take the furthest bunk on the furthest end, because he was on the far end where the light was. And I was in a third-story window uh, room, up at the top and uh, I told him I said well uh, now mind you guys this is the first time I ever told this story besides to somebody at the VA who never helped me get through my better rating they just kind of blew me off and gave me a stack full of paperwork that never accomplished nothing right so it's kind of sensitive to talk about but like I said it's something that someone needs to hear somewhere so I'm willing to challenge myself to do it so as I picked the far, far end of the room in the no lighted room there, I doze off and fall asleep. Somewhere in the middle of the night, I felt a hand on my face and I heard a whisper and a breath on my, on my forehead. And he says, don't say nothing. No one will know. Well, needless to say, he didn't know where I had been in my life or the the circumstances that I had to face as a young kid and a child at the age of 12 to the age of 18. But at that moment, I was fearful of my life and not only my life, but the things that was going to be done to me. Mm. So I had a stroke. Like I said, I took, I took boxing at Fort Dix and worked on one of the boxing teams there and was hopeful for 84 summers. Uh, but I didn't make it. I heard a friend and I quit. And uh, so needless to say, he felt what an uppercut 
would feel like coming straight up off of a bunk. When I heard his body hit the floor, I broke and run for the first light I seen. Not realizing I was on the third story floor. Mm. So I dove for the light and I realized it was a window. And the window outside was a far distance down. Mm. But I looked outside and there was a tree, a big old oak tree that I cleared down the side. And when I hit the ground, I heard a snap and I felt my knee be placed where my foot was and it had buried in the dirt. And as I laid there, the MPs come up and asked me what I was doing there. And I tried to explain to them what had happened. Well, they went up, one went up while the other stayed with me and uh, looked for this sergeant, so-called sergeant that was not in the room that he was designated supposedly to be at, go figure. So on my way to the hospital, they casted my leg. And once everybody found out what had happened, uh, my life become a nightmare in the military. Mm. Uh, next day I started PT in the rain. Needless to say, I had another cast placed on. And that went on till my leg didn't heal five casts later. So I walked with a permanent limp and my hips both shot. Well, I managed through life and I got a 10% VA rating for it. Okay, now mind you, uh, when you're disabled you're, and you used to be real active and, and used to have the world by, the, by what you say, the cojones, mm. uh, you don't know how it feels to be disabled. And uh, when you deal with post-traumatic stress, it's as real as you can get. The mind will do a lot of strange things to you when you don't have control of it. And when someone presses their issues on you and changes your life for the worse, it's not a good thing. I was distanced from my brothers in the military for many years because of it. During this time in Germany, my, my battalion commander caught wind of what had happened and made my life a living hell. One day we go out for uh, our convoy and I was at the end of the convoy with the ammunition of the 155 Howitzers, the M60s and the 50 cows. And uh, we had five soldiers on the truck and a sergeant. And I was the only private there. And as we're driving, our gore breaks down in the convoy. Maintenance passes me by. And as they stopped, they said, well, we'll be back to get you as soon as the convoy is over, Mr. Beck. And I took them for the word as they drove off. 11 o'clock at night, freezing rain, 35 below. And we don't have no top on it. We got six soldiers there besides myself and didn't know what to do. We had our sleeping bags and that was it. The only protection we had. Well, my sergeant decides he wants to go try to find help. Mind you, we was in bomb holder and there's no help to be found there if you look. And he takes off in the sleet and the rain and the snow. I never seen that sergeant again. I don't know what happened to him. I prayed there was nothing, but I don't think it was. Man. As my soldiers was there with me, we decide we need to bed down till they come back. I asked them to stay up on top of the ammo with me and we would, we would watch out for each other. They called me a fool that night. They said, we're going up underneath the door. We're going to lay down on the ground on the sleep with our sleeping bags, and we're going to go to sleep. You stay up on the ammo if you choose to stay up there. I said, that's fine, man. You made your choice. I make mine. So as I stayed up there, I zipped up, put the old sleeping bag, which was zero rated, to test that night and 35 below. And it didn't test very good because the old rain had rained inside that hole and had frozen my zipper sleep stuck. And after I tried to fall asleep like for three or four hours, shivering and shaking, when I finally did fall asleep, I like to never woke up. The next day when I came to, I knew I was in trouble because I couldn't get the sleeping bag out 
and I was froze solid. So I started beating the sleeping bag open and finally got the zipper to unstick. I go to hollering for the soldiers that was up underneath the truck and I never heard nothing. I continued my hollering until I got out of the sleeping bag. And as I crawled out, I heard some moans and it wasn't like a moan. I go, oh, it was a moan like you don't want to hear. Like yeah. a soldier had been shot or a soldier that had blew up or a soldier who lost a leg or a body part. It was a excruciating moan. As I get down off the door, I realize what had happened. In their haste to, to think that was better than me and crawl up underneath that gore, their sleeping bags had rose solid to the ground. Mm hmm rain and the, the the snow and all had frozen solid i go to beating the sleeping bags open for them and i got them all unzipped the best I could and i go to looking and i noticed that their hands and their feet were totally black mm. so i do his instant frostbite and now mind you we have nowhere to go no one to help and then i seen a, a in the far distance i seen a little jeep coming up and I think, thank you, Jesus, you've saved her life. The man that come out was a four-star general. And he said, soldier, what seems to be the problem? I said, sir, I've got four, five soldiers up underneath the truck. They're frozen in the sleeping bag, and I need to get them to the hospital. He said, well, how about you? I said, I'm not worried about me. I said, I'm worried about them. I said, because they're in worse shape than me. So he gets them and, and uh, he said, what seems to be the problem with you? And I said, the truck. I said, the truck's broke down. He said, well, I got a maintenance man right here. He had three other people there that was with him in the Jeep. His driver and the other two in the back, one of them was maintenance. Mind you, we had stayed from 11 o'clock that day, that night. And I asked him, I said, sir, what time is it? It was one o'clock the following afternoon. That's how long they left us there. Mm. They didn't leave us there to stay there and just catch a nap. They left us there to die. Mm. So that that advantage that says, you know, no soldier left behind, that's a lie. Yeah. That's a lie. Because this soldier they left behind. And it was all because of what someone else had done to me. Yeah. So excuse me for not being too friendly or excuse me for not feeling the love of the military because yeah. the military didn't love me like I loved it. I was a true blue soldier whose uncle not only was a hero, his son was a hero too who served Afghanistan and Iraq. He become another 22 the following year after his father passed away mm. from the same tree that he was found in. Mm. So my soldier brothers and uncles had been done wrong like I had been done. But I choose not to be the 22 because yeah. I had to be something that they wasn't like my father wasn't. So I'm glad you called me today and invited me in because this story wouldn't have never been told. That's right. But I want you to know that M MTS is real, man. It's real for, for men and women. And people put you in situations that sometimes you don't know how to get out of and you don't know how to ask for help. I don't still to this day ask for no help. You know, when I come out of the military, I had to find my purpose. Me and my wife had been married for many years. We've been married, it'll be 40 years in November. But when I met her, she had never had a boyfriend. And I can't say I had the same thing about my girlfriends, but. Uh, she was somebody I needed at the time and showed me truly what the first time I ever found what love was. Yeah. So uh, we started to teach children how to box. We started a nonprofit. We worked with troubled youth, at risk, special needs, and handicapable children. And we did that for 35 years for free. We only charged a hub when a kid come and a hub when a kid left so that they took their love with us when they got there and took our love when they left. Now, this is just a tease of my story. There's more that, that I couldn't even begin to say today that's, that was the front of it. Yeah. From, from 
from, you know, my dad put my mom in the state hospital just so he could cheat from leaving his daughter uh, that was one year old on a bar stool and walking away. Right. You know, it took me 30 years to find her. It took me 39 to find my mom. My mom, uh, I seen one time at the age of five, I, 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 I was taken away from her. At 16, I seen my mom one time. And I begged her to take me away because I was being abused at the time. And she said, yeah. because the law wouldn't allow it because of her being in the state hospital because of his infidelity. So it took me 39 years after finding her again. And uh, I got to tell her, you know, mom, I love you. And uh, I never thought in the wildest dream she would have said, I love you too, son, and I pray for you every day. I believe that, that her prayers is what made me survive all the things I've survived, man. I've been shot. I've been run over. I've been stabbed. I've been electrocuted out of a bucket during Hurricane Andrew. I've been drowned. I've run over twice by a car while I was on a motorcycle. My life has been horrific. But it was the grace of the Lord that gave me the grace to continue and fight on. For my brothers and my sisters loved me, but the government didn't love me, and they done me wrong. But I don't hold hate to any of it or any of my brothers and sisters. It was just something that God had chosen for me so that I could understand the people and the things that they have to go through in their lives. And I could counsel them and guide them into a better life for them. The one that God had intended for them to begin with in the first place. Right. It's, we never know what God's going to choose for us. Whether it's difficult or easy. But we have to learn within ourselves we have the warrior mentality. Because they gave it to us. Absolutely. They taught us how to kill. They taught us how to to be tough they taught us how to never quit but they don't really teach you how to recover yeah how to love again how to be a better person for what you've done and to be thanked by the people that you love the most because that's what you did it for in the first place yeah there's things in this world that you might not be able to understand man but there's someone in this world that does and his name is Jesus Christ. He was tortured and he was never loved till he left this world. I felt a lot of times that I was close like my brother was. I could never be perfect like him. I could never claim to be even close to him. But I could feel the hate that others had for him as well as for me. But that didn't change the way he loved or the way that I'll love you too. Because his love was the purest love, as yep. my love is too. And I hope that whatever I had to spill tonight resonates with just one person that's going through what maybe I have went through or something worse even. That it might touch them and show them through love, dedication, perseverance, and God himself. You can make it through it. Don't be one of the 22 brothers or nope. sisters. Don't be one of them. Amen. I have to remember you like I remember my uncle. Yeah. My my nephew or my cousin. And I that's you know, to remember a hero and to know that he fell short is a hard thing to swallow. It's a hard feel. Yeah. Because you look up to this individual who survived it all who's even had friends die upon him and he laid there for hours because somebody had shot his friend and he was signal on the front line trying to tell where this bomb needed to be or that one needed to be or where that enemy was or that enemy wasn't. But he survived it to give it up to be a 22. So if you're out there, man, and, and you ain't got nobody to reach out to, reach out to these two here that gave you that platform to be able to tell the story that you need to tell because a lot of times healing begins by telling. That's right. Without telling, 
you can't heal. It's like picking a scab. A scab will fester and it'll pus up. But if you allow it to pus, it'll continue to pus and you'll never be healed. Right. Once you remove that scab, everything of that pus comes running out and your healing begins. That's Took right. me years to figure that one out. Yeah. You know, I don't carry no hate. I don't carry none of this with me. I praise my father every day because the only true father I ever had is the one above me. And I don't want to think, I don't want y'all to think I'm holier than thou or I'm righteouser than any one of y'all because I'm not. I'm a sinner just like you. I was the worst alcoholic that you've ever met. You know, I rode with some guys that on Harleys that I shouldn't have never been with. But they didn't love me because when my bike was gone, guess what? I wasn't their brother no more. It's like I wasn't a lot of my brothers or sisters in the military because I had to tell them that other people didn't want to hear. But I want to tell you what, I was true blue. I'm American through and through. I'm proud of my country and the people who served before me and after me and during me. And I'll never forget or never not salute any one of y'all because y'all are what keeps this country free. And I'm sorry for the pain that any one of y'all has to go through or to survive through to make this country free and to look at it in the shape that it's in today is a sad, sad situation. Yep. Sad. I agree hundred percent. Absolutely. hundred percent. Brother, I, I'm so happy. I finally got to meet you. It's I've, seen you I've seen you in the chat. Um, and I said, man, I told Terry, I said, I got to meet this guy. And now I met you and you have absolutely, um, you're more than I thought you would be. Okay. I knew you were in the military. I knew you're a God fearing man. I know that, um, like I was telling Terry a long time ago, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't find Jesus. First of all, I didn't even know he was, he needed to be found, but right. I met him in the desert, uh, during the Gulf war. Right. I met him when uh, I had to zip up one of my soldiers. Yeah. And from that day forward, it's been a relationship um, that I've never had with him. And I keep telling people, you have to remember this. Jesus sits on the right-hand side of God. Amen. He sits there and he reads the daily paper. It's called the Earth Gazette. Yes, sir. And he's going in there and he's reading and he's going, oh, uh, Mike, Mike uh, got in a car accident and, and got really messed up. Oh, that's too bad. Turns the page. He goes, oh, my gosh, Jason, Jason's hurt. And why did he get excited for Jason? Because Jason has a relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. It's personal. It becomes personal Amen. then. And until I had that, I didn't feel that. You know, you got to praise him even in your darkest of hours. That's there, you what he go. there you go. You know, you know I want to tell you something. Um, I had a motorcycle wreck uh, in 03, and it threw me 30 foot up in the air, and I landed on my head and I bounced 70 feet, and I was dead on the scene. And I, too, had a relationship with Jesus. I carried him right here on my shoulder everywhere I went. I told everybody about his miracles, about everything that these old crippled eyes have seen. But I didn't, I didn't do as he asked me to do. So when I died and I stood before my father, I seen what others only wish or believe to see. And I seen God himself. I seen him as I'm seeing you two sitting right here. So he is real. Jesus is real and he's alive because I seen him and he sent me back to tell others. And the thing about it is you say, man, what did you see? I mean, what was it? Was it white? Was he black? Was he Asian? Was he tall? Was he fat? Was he short? 
Man, the best I can tell you is a 15-foot silhouette of nothing but pure light. Imagine the sun times 10, and that's what I've seen. But you know what? Being a welder all my life and being in the sun and all that working over there, I know light comes with heat. Heat's always around light. But you know, as I stood before him, no further than I am probably to my wife right now, who's sitting right beside me. He never gave off no heat. There's no heat to him whatsoever. And they asked me, well, how did you feel? Well, mind you, my fingers is on my arm. My brain stem is sitting outside my vertebrae. My spine is completely blown out. What I felt was like laying a quilt down on the ground, rolling yourself up tight like a burrito, standing up. That's the love, the joy, and the peace that will surround you as you stand before the Lord. Yeah. And as I stood, I fell on these old two crippled knees of mine and I started to weep because I knew I wasn't right where I needed to be. And I asked him, I said, Father, I said, why do I fail and fall so much? And he came to me in a whisper, brother, and he told me something simple because you didn't place me first. So when you fall and fail, I could have caught you and carried you the rest of the way. From that moment on, I placed God first. I've told of his miracles, of his faith, his love and his joy. But I also warned of the things that he's coming back as on a white horse with a sword, a double-edged sword that's going to wreak havoc to the centers of this world to abolish Satan for the final time. It's simple, man. It's as simple as you can feel. And as I left God, I asked him, Father, why must I go back? I'm happy here. He said, because your feet are dirty. I wake up and I felt something wet on my face. And I'm in the hospital bed with the, with the neck brace on. And what was wet on my face was a girl that was a cutter who cut herself. And she cut herself everywhere the humanly could touch, whether it was her legs or arms or shoulders or back. Anytime she wanted to cut and feel pressure relief, she would cut herself to release the pain because her parents too didn't accept her for who she was. Yeah. Her off the street. She was 17 and her parents moved to Australia and left her here as they worked a government job. And she had a lot of pain built up and a lot of anger and a lot of hate. And I like to never broke that shell. But with time and, and patience, I was able to crack that, crack that egg and show the beautiful swan that laid inside. And now the same girl they said wouldn't make it to 21 is 34. And I call her my daughter and she's got two of my grandbabies, my God grandbabies. And they're so beautiful, man, that she never would have thought that she could have been so beautiful in her life. But I showed her to the love of the Lord, anything is possible. Anything. Sure. So as I wake up, it took me many years to figure out what the dirt was on my feet. It was the hate that I held in my heart for the ones that abused me in this life. So I got down on my knees and I, I asked the Lord to remove it from me, that I forgive them of their sin and their hate, that I didn't do it for them, but I did it for myself. Yeah. It felt like two 55-gallon drums removed off of each one of my shoes. As I stood, I never felt no freer in my life. And I'd been washed that day, and I knew I was clean, and I've stayed clean ever since. As I told my sister the story, my sister told me, she said, Bubba, I want to tell you, my, my sister's a very God-fearing lady, always have been. Never doubt whether she is a believer. She was kind of like my mother figure when I didn't have one. And she said, Bubba, she said, you stayed so far into the Bible and God's journey that maybe the dirt wasn't the hate after all. And I said, sis, I don't understand. 
She said, mate, as a child, when the children followed Jesus, they followed him in his footsteps so close that the dirt from his footprints would kick up on them baby's feet as they followed him. And as I looked at it that way, it made me feel a lot better. It made me felt that I, I was walking close to my father all along and just didn't realize it. Yeah. But she's seen it. Yep. And sometimes somebody's got to open up your eyes, even if you don't see it. Hey, brother, hey, I hate to cut you short, but no. we did, and I wanted you to tell your story. And we appreciate everything that you've told us tonight. Absolutely. We you are in my prayers uh, and a true brother. And I, I just want to say thank you for coming on here. I want to order one of them shirts, but I either want my shirt OG green or I want my shirt purple because Jesus had purple. And I want to be different and unique, but I want to represent my two brothers here who allowed okay. me. Um, hey, uh, send me your address at uh, my if you go to empty homestead or on okay. here, just send me an email with your shirt size and an address I can send it to. Okay. And just tell me the price, brother. I don't mind. I don't mind buying it, man. That, that ain't got, I ain't a problem with that, man. Brother. I oh, got, we you. got you covered. I got, got you. both. And, and the love for me that to y'all is, is true, man. And, and I want y'all to know that. Well, all right, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Bless you both. All right. All right, guys. So that's our show for tonight. Um, I know it went a little bit long, but hey, I'm going to tell you something. You never, ever cut off a veteran when he's in the middle of telling his story. No, no. Like, we he, said, like he said, talking about it is therapy. I don't care who you are. And that's why we created this channel. Absolutely love Brother Dream. Uh, yeah, that I, that whole time I'm listening to him. I mean, obviously my heart and everything is for him, but it just solidified the very reason why we're doing this. Yeah, you know, and, and to to be able to get that, and you know, I, I just. It confirmed. I mean, you know, Mike, you and I have talked, you know, offline, obviously, before everything went live with it is, you know, we've been called multiple times from different ways to start this, this yes. outreach, you know, this channel, this ability for people to come on. And, you know, it's that story right there of exactly why we're doing this, you know, because it's going to reach the one. Um and I want to touch something real quick was just the fact that, you know, he talks about the 22 and I, I was recently reminded that 22 is only the number of people that actually report it based off the States that report it from the veteran centers. Yeah. That 22 is more like 45 to 50. Yeah. Um, you know, when you look at real, real time stats and, yeah. You know, it's easy to remember the 22, right? To, hey, that's an easy number. That That's what they put out everywhere. But right. the number is actually much, much higher, unfortunately. So, And you know, I just and pray, I just pray that people watch this episode far enough to get to meet Reverend Dream and hear oh, his. Oh, I hope so. Yes. So, guys, yeah. we, we thank everybody for coming in here. Um, we absolutely love you. Remember, think of that every chance you get. Uh, we will be live next Tuesday at 8 p.m. And it will be on duty stations and changing of military bases names. The names of bases have changed and it has made a lot of veterans angry. And we're going to talk about those bases that they felt needed a name change for the wokeness of America. So there you go. All right. So guys, we love you. God bless you. And speaking for me, we'll see you again on the next video, guys. We'll see you guys. I love you. Appreciate you. And uh, as always, hey, and make sure, next week. hey, make sure if you're at the, the 10 killer meetup, giving away some travel mugs, giving away some coffee mugs. All right, guys, we're going to be giving stuff away. 
Uh, we, met, we love you guys. We'll see you later. Bye.